Good morning, everyone. We just had a quick technical difficulty because that is my fault, but we will pick up with the opening video next week. But this is our first week uh, coming into the room. Uh, Didi's Cry is presenting children, uh, social and emotional support. And we're here with Crystal and Toy Burton. Again, it's our first week um, and Toy is going to come and introduce herself and talk about um, this event, and then we will get into our Saturday session and meet Miss Crystal, who I am excited to hear from in just a few moments. But um, Toy, go ahead and introduce yourself, and you can get me later for the video. Okay. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. My name is Toy Burton, and I am the founder and executive director of Didi's Pride Suicide Prevention and Family Support. I started Didi's Pride in 2017 after I noticed organizations that focus on mental health, education, and suicide prevention didn't do their things in the Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan areas of Boston, where I'm from, um, to me, communities of color. So I started Didi's Pride to make sure that these this information is accessible. And another way of making sure that it's accessible, all Didi's Pride events are free. So even pre-COVID, when we were in person, they were free. So if you want to support Didi's Cry, please go to our website, didiscry.com, and make a donation to help us keep bringing you programming that supports our community. And um, like I said, thank you for joining us. It was really important for me to start this program as a preschool teacher. And um, when I thought, who do I want as the host? Of course, Crystal McClure came to mind. She and I work in a, worked in a classroom together a few years ago, and she is just awesome. And if you was at Dee Dee's Cry first event, she was doing story time with Miss Crystal. So with further ado, let's welcome Crystal to the Dee Dee's Cry's family and take it away, Crystal. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Um, my name is Crystal McClure. I have been a teacher, intervention support advocate for families and children of mental health for over uh, 15 years. <laughs> um, I'm a mother, I'm a newlywed, um, and I, I, I support Toy's um, mission to bring awareness to mental health and suicide. I, I think her cause is great, trying to bring awareness to the deficit in our community and how that seems to be happening and it's going untalked about. So bringing awareness is definitely important. I support it. And I'm gonna bring to you the perspective from children, not necessarily suicide, cause that's a little scary when it comes to children. However, supporting their mental health, supporting their social emotional stability is very important. And if we do it at a young age, then hoping we can have a good chance at raising solid, strong adults that won't have these mental health issues. So hopefully we can make that connection and I hope you enjoy my presentation. Feel free to be interactive, ask questions, um, and let's get started. So um, for you, uh, Crystal, before we get started, why is it important that we even think about children's emotional um, 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 and, and, and they're, they're sort of self-care for lack of better words. You know, some, you know, old folks used to say, oh, children are to be seen, you know, and not heard and things like that. Like, why should we as adults even consider emotional support for them? Because we're the ones building our children. Our children learn from us, especially as parents or guardians, foster parents, uncles, whoever's raising the children, they're learning from us. So we have to instill it in them. They're not born with it. You know, so we have to show them how to, we need to show and um, nourish those coping skills and teach them how to be self-sufficient and, and strong-willed and, and build that self-esteem up so that it can be a natural thing to them. If we don't invest in it, then we don't know what we're gonna get out of it. And we don't wanna gamble with our baby's social emotional ability. Right. So we wanna definitely put in so that we can get positive coming out. And would you say even more so now in the pandemic? Oh goodness, even more so now because, and, and hopefully because of the pandemic, they're getting that because they're home now, they're with their families now. So families now get to see 
what their children, I don't want to say what they're like, but they're not going to school anymore. <laughs> There's a lot of so, Go ahead, I'm sorry. They're, they're home with you every day now. So I'm assuming you're getting more, more conflict, more concerns, more back and forth, maybe a little defiance. And you're probably also learning, even if you was a first time, second time, third time mom, you're probably experiencing some things you didn't experience before. And I would love to give some support during this pandemic, not knowing how much longer we're going to be in this situation. Yep. Well, we're yeah. going to jump right in and then I'll just say a little joke before uh, we get started to bring uh, okay. your wonderful presentation up. But early on in the pandemic, a lot of people were posting memes about parents are learning that everything that the teacher said about their children <laughs> is absolutely true. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> I mean, first we want to say they're 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 lovely children. Oh, they're, right. they're they're super smart. But yes, teachers, I take my hats off to teachers. And I mean, I've I've had my teaching time and I enjoyed it. I loved it. I have now been in the role for a couple of years of actually dealing with behaviors and families and giving parents supports on how to deal with those children and their concerns and strategies and giving them connections to the community on how to support those challenges or delays or anything of that matter. So yeah, um, welcome to our world. Because <laughs> you did prepare a presentation, we just want to say this is not a space where we're just conversing, though conversing is a part. Crystal is going to give you tips and tricks and things and, and just engagement around supporting children. So we're going to jump right in this morning with our first presentation. And here we go here. I think I got everything queued up and OK, we're 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 doing good till we get to the video. But go ahead, Crystal. <laughs> Hopefully the video works. All right. So today's topic is going to be fostering self-esteem and encouraging social and emotional growth in our babies. Building our children up at an early age is so, so important, as we stated earlier, because this is where it begins. This is where it starts and we want to put in so that we can get out. We can go to the next slide. All right, so what is self-esteem? To be confident in your abilities and to be prepared to face and overcome the obstacles of the world, to have an optimistic worldview, and to not internalize your failures, but be resilient. When failure presents itself, trying to do better, I can fix it, I can do it, I know I can, are the responses that we wanna get. It is the positive, no, go back. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It is the positive or the negative evaluation of oneself and how you feel about it. So how you see yourself, how the children see themselves, how you present that you see your child matters. Go to the next can I ask so Yes. Your uh, childhood can have an influence on how you um, old school, how you rear or raise your child, correct? Absolutely. I mean, if we're saying things like you're bad and you don't listen and I'm tired of talking to you and, and, and we're putting out that energy, that's, the, you know, children don't know negativity. They don't know that 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 negative aspect of the world. So we want to put in positive. I'm not saying we want to create a fairy tale world. You know, <laughs> we want to let them know that there will be challenges, but we want to encourage them to do things. We want to build up their self-esteem. So we do want to be mindful of what we're saying to them when we get frustrated. Okay. Oh. All right. What is low self-esteem? <sighs> this this one kind of gets to my heart because I've, I've encountered a few children with low self-esteem and it was kind of due to their environment. And it's like at school, you're trying to pick it up and build it up. But, you know, it takes a community. So low, so, low self-esteem is when someone lacks confidence about who they are and what they can do. They often feel incompetent, uninvolved or inadequate. There are people who struggle with low self-esteem are consistently afraid about making mistakes or letting other people down. So they, they don't have the energy or the willingness to want to keep trying because they don't have that self-esteem. They don't have that confidence. So you want to constantly say, yeah, you could do it. Try it again. Oh, that's OK that you made a mistake. The next time we'll try it again and hopefully we'll do better. So you always want to Spin, spin even those negative situations in a positive light. 
having versus not having self-esteem. So if you have a child with self-esteem, they're going to feel liked and accepted, happy to go to school. They're going to feel confident about the things that they do. They're going to want to show you what it is that they did and how they did it. And you're going to feel that energy. They feel proud of what they can do. Um, they think good things about themselves. They believe in themselves. And you can you can just feel good self-esteem in a toddler or a preschooler. Or even if we're talking about adolescents, I mean, they, they're just willing to go out into the world and just try things and do things, join in sports, participate in activities, or even just come home and tell you about their schoolwork. You know, so you can feel a kid with self-esteem. And our children with low self-esteem, they're very critical and hard on themselves. Oh, that wasn't good enough. Oh, that C wasn't good on my on my math test or whatever. They feel that they're not as good as the other kids. Well, so and so did this and so and so did that. And how come I can't? And it's just a constant question about what they can and can't do. Um, think of times that they that they can't rather than when they can succeed. Um, they lack confidence and they doubt what they can do as well. So if you're seeing those traits in your child that seems like they're constantly questioning what they're capable of doing or what they have done, and it just always seems to be that negative down and disappointing vibe, you want to encourage that. You want to you want to foster that because that that's the hill that we don't want to go down. That means they need extra input. They need extra positivity to build that up. And you might not get it right away, but you got you got to keep trying. You got to keep trying. With Crystal, based on what you just said, if I could ask, it just, it unfortunately amazes me that we have to talk about children in this context because I'm trying to get a, a visual of the child that's very active and outgoing in the playground and then you have a child that's kind of withdrawn off to the side and like to corner. Yeah. And so is that, could that be a sign that, you know, that, that, that child may maybe not have as much self-esteem or may at some point encountered even with children, because, you know, children are brutally honest um, and there are group dynamics that play out in the playground. Um, but it just amazes me that we have to, cause you said that children aren't naturally, maybe not verbatim, but they're, they're not prone to be negative. And so when we notice this, I guess you'll go into some ways that parents can kind of begin to assist or at least tips and tricks that we were talking about, but it just, I had to chime in and say, it amazes me to think about how we take what you're teaching and translate that into actual observation. Like to see that in real time would be, it would be interesting. I, I would I would like to add to that, um, speaking from the teacher's hat that I've had, we're always encouraged as teachers to not just pay attention to the ones who are rambunctious and loud and busy and going, and those are the ones that we're like trying to work with the most because they seem to present some of the most challenges because they're so busy, but to also pay attention to those silent children, those children that could often be overlooked. Now you gotta take into account that children have different temperaments, whether they're shy, they're vocal, they're active, or they're just the type of they're the type of children that like to just observe before they interact. So I, as teachers, we're always encouraged, and I encourage them as well, to encourage those little children, even if it's just a little bit day by day, or if you have to bring the child into the group and you know sit with them and play with them a little bit and then bring another kid into the group so that they can start to do that engagement. Some children just don't have those social skills. Doesn't necessarily mean they don't have high self-esteem, but they just may not have the social skills. So we wanna foster that. And for parents, ask those questions when you're bringing your kid to school. Ask your teacher those questions. If you see that your kid's going to school and they're hesitant to join in or jump in or they're not excited to go to school, ask the teacher, how are they during playtime? Who's, who's their friend? Who do they talk to? Who are they most connected to? Are they connected to anybody? And if you get the feedback that that sounds like something that needs to be worked on, oh, I can't advocate enough because I'm that parent. Yep, yep. <laughs> going to show up and participate 
and be there during the day to assess how my kid is doing and teachers welcome that. Now I know it's the pandemic, so maybe I need you to add me in on a virtual call or a virtual Zoom session so I can observe my baby. There's, where there's a will, there's a way. There's always a way to go around it. And if your kid is in school, hopefully they're safe, but don't let that be a barrier to being able to see your children in the classroom. Even if the teacher takes a video, you know, but definitely be engaged. And last but not least, that little point in the middle, which is like a very important slogan, um, the way we talk to our children becomes their inner voice. So what you say to them chirps in their little ear silently. You wanna watch what you say <laughs> and go to the next one. <sighs> How do we support self-esteem? So I have a 14 year old and she's in, <laughs> she's about to be in high school now. Oh my God. <laughs> but, <laughs> oh my goodness. So her school used to have this slogan, this mantra every morning. And it was like, I love myself. I believe in myself. I know I can. I always do it. And it was like something they did every single morning. And I give a shout out to Miss Thompson at the Trotter, William Monroe Trotter School, because she, you know, promoted that. I'm sure the teachers did as well. But that stuck to me. Like when I'd seen her first year and I seen that mantra, it it warmed my heart to hear all those children on the schoolyard singing that mantra every single morning. Mm -hmm. And yep. the teachers were singing it and it was such a community. Oh, it gives me goosebumps, but it was awesome. Go ahead, you're gonna ask a question. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm like, it, 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 just to hear that and I'm aware of that uh, when, when we talk about the chirping ears because words do matter and even- they do. The thing is, I'm not a clinician, not a child specialist or anything, but I've been around clinicians and stuff to know that yes. at that fo those formative years, Crystal, they are hugely important. And it's like you can, like you said earlier, you just can't say things and, and don't think that the child doesn't retain. It's in their spirit. And, and yes. then if they hear it in the world, it almost... It validates it, it. yeah uh, and see mm. that all right i'm sorry you're the you're the presenter here i Go got ahead. you no I, I love the engagement i i, I yep. feel your spirit yep. and so i just i i i encourage that and again that that self-awareness and that input comes at different stages. It doesn't just start at the younger age. You also got to think about it when they hit eight and they start going into third and fourth grade. Then when they get to middle school, high school, like I'm, I feel like I got a whole nother level, just like as if she was three going into high school. Now she cares about the image. She cares about how they're going to see, how they're going to view, like her self-esteem is there, but you can tell that she's still in the process of building it, you know? So you wanna, if you could do that every morning with your children, let them know how good they are, how positive they are. Let them say it about themselves and make that a ritual. Promote conversations with your children. I think that's key. It's, it's the biggest thing you can do is start a dialogue with your child. How was your day? Why do you, what's the matter? Did, did something happen? What's wrong? Tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what happened today. They don't want to tell you, aim a little bit. Well, did is did the teacher, is everything okay? Did the teacher give you lunch? Did the teacher play with you during such and such activity? Maybe you have to ask questions to get them to start talking or what, what did you do today? What assignment did you do? Did you draw a picture? Did you color something? And that, that might, you know, blow them up a little bit and then before you know it now they're rambling on because you didn't trigger the conversation that they do want to talk about so you got to kind of poke and prowl just a little bit and hopefully that will foster even for adolescent children i i constantly have conversations with my 14 year old about her friends and how she interacts with them and the different things that they're going through as children and she's like wow mommy you were right and oh i see this and it's just like well how do you feel about that and how do you view this like you want to create that dialogue because when you tie it back to toys purpose of suicide prevention and mental health, not expressing your feelings, not having a conversation about what you're going through turns into that mental health concern. People are beating you down, but they're not expressing it and no one's taking the time to ask about it so that they can get it off their chest and maybe be mentored or guided to 
deal or get support with that concern. They, these kids don't, they don't know everything. They don't have the skills. Even if they're turning 10, 12, 13, 14, they still need your support. They still need for you to have a conversation. Don't assume that because they are coming across confident and their self-esteem seems good, that you still don't need to have those conversations. You know, so yes, just to bring it back to that suicide awareness, have those conversations because that will allow them to bring to you their concerns if you foster that early. Absolutely. Yeah. And it is, it's funny because you brought it there and I'll just reiterate that um, doing this now for, for uh, women and not to get in relationship things, but doing this now with your son is going to help somebody later. Doing this now with your daughter is going to help somebody later because you tapped into the fact that they begin to not bottle up and not hold things in. But if you create an environment early that they know how to converse about what bothers them, it kind of makes it easier when things come up and they don't hold things in that lead to things like suicide, that lead to things like anxiety, that lead to things like, you know, um, um, conduct or perceived conduct disorder because they're just quiet, but no, they just need to talk. So I'm, I'm yeah, and discuss your emotions as well. You know, let them know on a child's level and yeah. age appropriate conversations. <laughs> discuss your emotions as well. <laughs> let me just and add not that. Your issues either. <laughs> okay, not not your love life, you know. So have those conversations as well about how you're feeling. Let them know that they're not alone. You can go to the next slide. Um, create a reward system. I don't think this is too small for the young ones or the older ones. You know, commend them on what they're doing, whether that's taking your kid to the mall or giving your child a sticker. You see, I'm trying to do the different ages on the spectrum. You know, you know, you got an eight-year-old and, you know, oh my goodness, you did such a good job. You want to help mommy cook later. You want to help daddy cook later. Just always let them know it's good to acknowledge and it's also good to give an incentive. I didn't say candy. I didn't say snack. And I'm not saying every single time because we don't want them to think that every time they do something good, they're going to get something in return. However, if we're trying to build that self-esteem, we definitely want to give incentives to kind of encourage it a little bit more. And as well as community building, if your kids go to grandma's house, dad's house, nana's house, whoever you call it, make sure they're on the same page. What you're doing with your child, you make sure everybody that's Babysitting your child is doing the same thing because that matters. It takes a community. It does. And I would say, you know, we always got the aunts in the family that's just a little more liberal. And so if they want to always, you know, you said you got a 14 year old. If this summer all of a sudden she wants to go over there a little bit more, I know you'll be like, uh, I'm going to come over with you. But then knowing you, you'd have a sense of. <laughs> Where she's mm -hmm. going. Oh, I was on, I was on, I, you know, I checked the phones because I got 14 year old. I look at the phone like, wait a minute. So you went to auntie's house and you was on the phone till 2 a.m. in the morning. Okay, we got to talk to auntie because my baby doesn't have her phone 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. I'm just going to say nothing good comes out of a kid on the phone and on a tablet at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. Okay. Yep. Hey, we go right here. <laughs> Let's go and maybe ask, ask Corey if we can do uh, this, you know, little after dark so we can really talk to the parents. Um, all right. I know you're going to say it. next slide. <laughs> statements. And you said it earlier, Jimmy, statements that don't support social emotional growth. Children are to be seen and not heard. This is such an old school theory. It's not true. <laughs> However, wait. Let me take that back. Yeah. It's not true to an extent. If you're arguing with hubby or, or friends or you having a conversation that a child shouldn't be hearing, yes. Nope, I shouldn't see you either. I shouldn't see you and I shouldn't hear you. <laughs> if I'm having a conversation that's not fit for your ears and also be mindful that they can hear you even with the door closed. Don't think because they're in the room with the door closed, they can't hear what's going on. Take that conversation outside. Um, but yes, I know my grandmother's a big, she's for this slogan of children are to be seen, not heard. And it's like, no, I, I need her to express her emotions. I need her to be able to tell me why she doesn't want to eat 
she don't like what you cooked. It don't <laughs> taste good. <laughs> you know, like I, I'm, I'm, you know, that might have been a little off topic, but I'm just saying you don't know what their reasonings could be. And if you took the time to allow them to be heard and not just seen and always telling them to be quiet or stay in a child's place, you would get some really valuable information and would be really amazed and shocked at what these children have in their brains and how they think and how they see things. Now you about to re- you about to hear my old school come out because I hear some of the way that today's children um, engage and share their feelings with parents. And Crystal, uh, I probably got you by a couple of years, but when I was growing up, you ate what was at the table. And you didn't have a choice to tell your parents you don't like broccoli. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm listening to you, and I immediately go back to the old school like. Somebody, I don't know, maybe the younger parent, I'm struggling because I'm like, I, I just can't remember when a time I, I'm not eating that. No. you. And then you sat at the table until you fell asleep. <laughs> Face of the plate. <laughs> you eat them darn nasty baked beans. And, and um, so yeah, I love baked beans. I do too now. But it's like, how do we balance? How do you, what would you say to an old school parent? Um that is trying to get on a path of engaging with their, maybe, maybe it's a grandparent that's raising their grandchild. And, you know, this child is very outspoken, rightfully So they share their feelings and, you know, some of these parents are like, how do they handle <laughs> the shock of what is going to come out of some of these children's minds? Now, granted, there, there's, there's going to be a balance. Okay. One, especially from the early age, forceful eating, you don't want to make eating a bad experience. So at at least at the early age, allow them to make those decisions. Let's not start that. And again, everyone's different. Cultures are different. So, you know, let's respect that. But on a general level, you know, can't get down to every scenario, but you want to, you want to encourage them to eat those things. I had it. I remember I had a student Oh, I love that little boy. And he was the pickiest little eater there could be. And he was, it was a texture concern. It wasn't that he didn't like the food. It was the texture in his mouth that he didn't like. So if it was, you know, applesauce or mashed potatoes or something that wasn't a solid, it, it one, it would get stuck in his throat. Two, he didn't like the texture. But as a parent, are you going to know that? Not if Unless you, don't. you went to the doctor and the doctor told you, or, you know, if you're very in tune with your child, you notice the foods that he seems to keep turning away. Maybe you can eventually come to that assessment. However, there could be a multitude of reasons why that child doesn't want that particular food. Maybe it doesn't sit well in their stomach and they don't know how to tell you that. They just know that the last time it didn't feel good and they don't want to touch that again, you know, but I would definitely just take a bite. You know, you have a little bit of this, I give you a little bit more dessert, you know, or I see you like the the rice, which I see my daughter's a rice eater. You eat a little bit of the broccoli, I give you a little bit more rice and in proportions. You know, we don't want to overextend your plates of food with, you know, unhealthy snacks just to get them to have a piece of vegetable. But it doesn't hurt. Again, incentives. You got to play investigation with these kids. <laughs> you have to try. You got to trial and error. So many different things. So I can't even really tell you one thing that's going to necessarily work for your child. But definitely try a little bit of this and I give you a little bit of that. Oh, ooh, watch mommy try it. Oh, it's so good. Oh, look at daddy try it. Oh, it's so good. Can you can you just take a little bit for mommy? And, you know, I'll let you go play with your Legos a little bit longer. Or you just give me a bite and then you could be all done. But you, you may know, <laughs> I'm sorry. You may also in that find out no matter how many incentives you give, if they say no to that one particular thing and you've provided four or five incentives, something I would think in the parent's mind clicks and says, okay, I don't offer chocolate, Legos, PlayStation, and an extra hour up on Saturday evening. You know, if this is a, I don't know, six, it's seven, not four. working. Then that might draw, okay, for you to go and say, well, why? And it may cause them to say, but mommy, I just, last time I ate it, I don't like it. And you know, things like that. But, um, I'm, I'm what you call it. I know Toy's going to get us. Cause we, we, we got to, uh, move on. Oh, we but ain't this is 
Um, children don't. Oh, let me one little thing. There was this one child that the parent was trying to get them to eat broccoli. And again, this comes back to the conversation. The child was watching a cartoon and the character was a broccoli. He felt like he was eating the broccoli man on the cartoon. I'm just gonna leave that right there because you just never know where their minds are going and what's in the back of their head. Moving on. Children <laughs> don't deserve the respect of a conversation. That ties into this as well have a conversation. They are little humans. They are little people. You don't know what connections they have made in their brain with that example as to why they may be doing something. Just going to leave you with that. But mommy, why? Because I said so. That if you feel as though that's a suitable answer to each its own. However, have a conversation. The, I Just because I said so, that's, that's putting off energy that they don't understand. You know, like help help me understand, mommy. But why? Because I want to keep you safe. Because this isn't safe, or because if you do this, your tummy's gonna get so full. You eat too much candy, and your tummy's gonna hurt. And give them an explanation. Don't feel like they don't deserve the respect of an explanation. You and know. When we start doing this. Are we doing this at four or five years? Are we giving children explanations at four or five years old? There's all types of levels of conversation. You got to tailor it to your baby. You can have a conversation with a three and four year old. It may not be a back and forth, long, extended conversation, <laughs> <laughs> but you can have a conversation with your child. Let the, you know, but why do you feel sad? Because, you know, Johnny took my toy and it's like, you have a whole nother toy right there, but that toy has the right handle. Okay. So it's not about, I just want to be selfish. This toy has something specific that I like, that I want. And you didn't know that. You just, have I said so? Share your toy. Listen, this is a lot of because there's a learning curve that a lot of parents are going to um, um, experience listening to this crystal. So go ahead. I'm sorry. Just try it. That's all I'm saying. You know, it doesn't hurt to try and try to improve every day. Um, that's not how you do it. Let me show you. That's automatically demeaning them. You know, oh, you did an amazing job. And that's the next slide. And because I know we're short for time, I'm going to do the what not say, what to do say. Um, that's not how you do it. Let me show you. More or less, I see that you did it that way. Good job. Can I show you another way that you could think about? You know, or that that 13 year old who went and cleaned the kitchen and didn't get all the spots on the table. Hey, you did a good job cleaning the kitchen. Um, but you want to make sure that we do the whole kitchen and there's a spot right here. So let mommy get it and let me do it. And next time we're going to make sure we get everything and make it more of a collaborative team. You know, yeah. um, practice makes perfect. The world isn't perfect. Children aren't perfect. People aren't perfect. That's that la la land world that me personally, I do not encourage to make my child believe that the world is perfect and unicorns and lilies and balloons. There's, there's things that can be a little scary. There's conversations that may not be the best conversations or maybe they don't want to hear depending on the age. Um, I do everything for you. Let's try to stay away from that. Stop crying right now or I will. I'm sure majority of us might have said that. I might have said it in my day and time too. I'm not going to lie. But I don't want to instill fear in my child. I want respect but I don't want to instill fear because respect allows for a conversation and dialogue. Fear allows for me to just do what you say and I tell you nothing. Um, and it's my way or the highway. That's one sided. You can have it your way. That means I'm not going to talk to you. That means I'm not going to express my feelings to you. That means I'm going to keep things to myself because it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter what I want. It only matters what you want as a parent. Okay. So then you're wondering why they're not talking to you. I don't think my mic was on. Um, where was this when um <laughs> when I was coming up, Jesus? Okay, um, before I get in trouble. <laughs> um, we can really go by this one because when we spoke about the other one, we kind of included this. Um, children should be loved and respected. Now, this is really the bulk of it where I want, and we're we're getting pretty close. This is where I really want parents to start thinking. These are the four types of parenting styles. And what type of parent or guardian are you? You have an authoritarian figure. Those are the parents that are my way or the highway. Do as I say, don't question me because I said so. Those are the parents that are not creating a dialogue. 
It's just their way. They're the boss. Do as I say. End of story. Mm, you choose whether you want to be that parent if you want a conversation with your child. Then you have the negligent parent, the parent that's really could care less. Go to Johnny's house, go to Sarah's house, who I ain't never met. Don't know who their parents are. Never had a conversation with them or, you know, don't care about what time you get back home or I'm not calling to check in. That's you don't want to be negligent. You want to be on top of that. You want to call in. Let me talk to the parent. Let me make sure I know who's at that parent's house because things happen in other people's homes. And if you just would have picked up and made a phone call and investigated the situation, we might have eliminated a lot of situations that my heart can't even fathom yep. at the yep. moment. But I'm, yep. I'm sure you understand where I'm going with that. Yeah. Um, then you have the permissive parent, the parent that's just like, oh, OK, you're going to Sarah's house. All right. Well, you know, make sure you're back by dinner. And, you know, I know it's a boy and he's 17 and you're 14, but, you know, just make sure everything's OK. Well, so negligent and permissive go hand in hand. The permissive parent is the, the negligent parent doesn't care. The permissive parent does care but doesn't have the skills or the ability to actually ask those questions and assess. Those could be the really working hard parents, the parents that just don't have the time. And it's just like, okay, go ahead. You know, and it's like, well, I don't want to. And I didn't had a long day at work and I just can't wrap my head around having this back and forth with you go with it. So they go hand in hand, but the permissive parent does care. The negligent parent is very absent minded. What we want to aim to be is the authoritative parent, the parent who does command respect, does put out boundaries and limits, does investigate, you know, asks questions, opens the dialogue, creates limits and boundaries with an explanation. Now, granted, there are certain subjects that are non-negotiable. Absolutely. And I'm not trying to say that that's not true. <laughs> you can have a conversation, but that doesn't mean it's going to go your way. <laughs> but I heard you. I allowed you to express your feelings, but it doesn't mean that I'm going to go with how you're feeling and what you're saying just because you said it. So I just want to add that part. That don't mean we're being pushovers and allowing the children to just speak their piece and say what they want and we're just going with it. No, you're still setting boundaries. You're still setting limits. Well, I want to go to Johnny's house. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock at night. So, I mean, we can try again tomorrow when it's daylight and mommy can know where you're going and where you're at. And I know, you know, people are awake and yeah. So given a reason, I heard your feelings, but this is why mommy thinks this is a better decision. Okay. And it gives them a skill set too, to where not just with their parents, but even with their supervisor, they'll hear them, but it gives them a skill set when the supervisor even says, Thank you for sharing your opinion, but unfortunately, we're going a different way. That way, you're not taking your basketball and leaving the court at 35 years old. Yeah, I don't want you to set up and think that because you expressed your feelings, you're going to get what you want. No, that's not the reality of the world. But no one should ever belittle you to where you can't speak your mind and speak your peace and state your stance in a timely manner and appropriate way. There's a place for everything. You know, however, don't assume that every single time. And you can say that to your kid. I hear that makes you sad, honey, but I'm sorry, but we got to finish our homework today, you know, and that's just the way of the world. So, again, I heard why I told you why. And now I'm moving on. OK, are we going to slide in that case? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so All this right, is we're... a quick this is a quick little video. You think we could do the video? I, 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 I do. We're going okay. to for right now okay um, say it again okay so it's a quick look you go ahead and talk i'm gonna put you on screen by yourself okay go ahead and then i'm gonna get you could talk for a second i'll tell you when okay we're right. so this video is you know i was trying to find something so you could have a visual of what i'm describing to you as far as the the negligent the authoritarian the authoritative parent all four parenting styles this is more of a teenager but you can tailor it. Anything you do at the younger level, you're going to end up doing at the later level. And you just got to tailor it, make it age appropriate, create that dialogue. So this is a quick little two minute video that kind of shows you a conversation between a parent and her child in different scenarios of this girl trying to go to Johnny's house. 
Okay, we're going to have it queued up in just two seconds. We 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 got it. I think here we go. Uh, that one there. And I I think we I think we did it. Here we go. Oh, we um, did it. Okay. I think we did. Hold on. So as you look at this video, just which parent are you? And let's work to be better. <laughs> Depending on which one you pick. <laughs> Hey, Mom, Caitlin and I want to go to Josh's house. Mom, can I go to Josh's house? Whatever. The uninvolved parent. No type of back and forth, no conversation. She could care less. Hey, Mom, Caitlin and I want to go to Josh's house. Who's Josh? Never heard you talk about him before. He's just a guy from school. He's a senior. Well, who's all going to be there? I don't know. A bunch of my friends, I guess. Well, have fun. Let me know if you need a ride. That's the permissive parent. See, she cared, but she did not ask the proper questions. Not enough. <laughs> so the authoritarian parent. Hey, Mom, Caitlin and I want to go to Josh's house. Who's Josh? No, Never heard you talk about him before. He's just a guy from school. He's a senior. Absolutely not. But mom, everyone else is going. All my friends will be there. There is no way I'm going to let you hang out with an older guy I've never met before. He's just a guy from school, mom. He's fine. My answer is no. But mom. End of discussion. Good grief. She, always she means well. That decision was right, but she didn't create a conversation. Authoritative, the one I would love for everybody to encourage. Hey, to mom. Be. Caitlin and I want to go to Josh's house. Who's Josh? I've never heard you talk about him before. He's just a guy from school. He's a senior. Well, what's going on at Josh's house? Just some friends hanging out. Well, I don't know Josh or his parents. He's just mm -hmm. a guy from school, Mom. Well, that's fine. But I need to give Josh's parents a phone call to make sure they're going to be there. Mom, don't do that, please. Don't you trust me? I do trust you, but I need to get to know Josh's parents a bit. What do you think is going to happen? I just don't want you to find yourself in a situation that neither one of us is expecting. Well, neither do I. Then you should be okay with me calling Josh's parents, making sure everything checks out, and then you can go. See? Simple. It's not always that simple, but I'm just saying. <laughs> so that that's the parent we want to encourage to be. She gave some pushback. She had her, but mom, but why? Like, you're going to embarrass me. And, you know, don't you try? Of course I trust you. I don't want you to think that I don't trust you. But just because you want to do this and just because I trust you doesn't mean I'm not supposed to do my job as a parent and investigate and double check and make sure that even when your children are out of sight and should never be out of mind, are safe and the environment that they're in is safe. So you do do your due diligence check on your children, know who they're talking to, know who they are got surrounded by them. Cause you know that saying birds of the feather flock together. They don't necessarily come together because they're the same, but they eventually can turn out to be the same, could. <clears throat> so be mindful of that. Next slide. So I don't need to really read this word for word. It's just a little bit more in depth understanding of the authoritative parent you know, which is the parent who's asking questions, their, their response is high, they ask, they engage, they give you their reasoning, they hear your reasoning, and it's a discussion, it's a dialogue, but you're still creating those boundaries and setting those limits. The authoritarian parent is the parent, that's because I said so, don't really care how you feel about it. This is what it is. I'd like to think a lot of us is more the authoritarian parent. I, I was at a point and I learned as with my 14 year old, I also got a newborn. <laughs> so, you know, I done went there and then started over and, you know, so. Hold on, oh, cause your 14 year old a few years from now <laughs> is gonna be like, wait, ma, like they're doing what? No, they just got, to, <laughs> they just got the benefit from the evolution of my parenting. <laughs> I'm were... just saying that trial and error, I hate how that sounds sometimes, but it, <laughs> this truth to me. <laughs> look, look, you'll be okay because you will have communicated with them and they will have been able to express their feelings by the time. But by the time Absolutely. you're four, you're I... 12, your 26 year old is going to be like, wait, what? Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to tell you. And, um, 
But I, I would like to think me and my daughter, we have a phenomenal relationship. The communication is there. I'm not saying everything is perfect, but I like to think I, I, I hit the nail on the coffin with this one so far at 14. I'll check back in with you when she's 18. However, at the moment, so far, so good. <laughs> um, so, and then you got the passive parent who cares, but doesn't do what she's supposed to do or do her due diligence. And then the children are just walking all over you, doing what they want to do, when they want to do it. You don't got no boundaries, no limits. Then you have the uninvolved parent, which is the parents that probably typically get 51 A's filed on them type of scenario. You're not asking. You could care less. You're not paying attention. You don't know where they are. You don't know what they're doing. You don't know how this happened, how they got that bruise, who said. We want to know those things. We can go on to the next slide. Final thoughts. Wrapping it up. As parents, we do the best that we can. Please know that every day is a work in progress and mistakes will be made. However, creating dialogue with your child is important for opening the lines of communication. Lines of communication allows for us as parents and guardians and aunts and uncles and grandparents to understand our children's feelings and to support them to the best of our abilities. Tips to take away, at least I hope you take away from this conversation. Um, aim to be that authoritative parent who encourages dialogue and sets boundaries and limits. Always make sure your children feel heard with boundaries and limits. <laughs> Ask questions and respect, might I add. Ask questions to better understand their feelings and problems. Create limits and boundaries with explanation as to why they're important. And last but not least, love and enjoy your children and make sure you're experience, you're, you're, you're creating memories. You know, these conversations, they will look back on. My mother is deceased, she passed when I was 16, but even in those 16 years of being with her, she was that parent that didn't play. She set the limits, she set the boundaries, but we had amazing conversations. And I'm grateful and I'm blessed for those few years of adolescence that I did have with her that she did encourage and we were able to have those conversations about who I was liking, how I was feeling. And this is a conversation for another day, but you yeah. know, teenagers have feelings, puberty matters. Don't be and in denial. Not just emotional, but we also, and someone taught me this, that age does not, and we can talk about this later, age does not negate the fact of with their emotional feelings, when they start that physical they got feelings too, and that stuff starts peaking. Okay, so that's another session. That's Toys another setting. But uh, I just I, I encourage parents don't don't be in denial and keep that conversation not, open because you're gonna be a grand early. Um, have that conversation. Don't be in denial. That's all I can say. That's my slogan. Have that conversation. Don't be in denial. <laughs> you might need to add that to the branding here. So I, 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 I I want to encourage you all. I'm going to take Crystal and I off the camera for just one second and encourage you to go ahead and do a screenshot. Take a screenshot of this while you're watching this live because you're walking away. The video is going to be available, but you have a quick pick to look at when either that teenager or that five year is getting on your nerves. So I'm definitely going to go ahead and bring our executive director back in the room. We went a little bit longer today. It's the first session. There's some things that Crystal was saying that... Um, <clears throat> <laughs> um, were very new um, and, and, and different for me and how I was reared and how I interacted and I'm here. And so, um, yeah, my nieces and nephews, if they're watching or ever see this, going to be like, yo, uncle, uh, you was mad different from what Crystal said. <laughs> 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 but Crystal, I want to personally say, and I, um, we don't do as much in the comments when we have presenters to make sure that the presenter doesn't get distracted. But I just wanted to go and just reiterate some of the things um, that were put in the comments around people really um, enjoying what you had to share um, in the presentation this morning. So, you know, affirming that we need to have these conversations and spaces. There are a lot of parents here. There are some grandparents here um, as well. So we just want to affirm, Crystal, and thank you for presenting. This is our inaugural um, session, um, and it was definitely dope, and we kept good folks in the room. We went a little bit over, but we're going to try to stick for the next 12 weeks to a half an hour to give you some tips and tricks to help you with social and emotional learning. I'll take down, and Crystal, if you want to say close anything before we turn it back over to Toy to close us out. Um, what you say, it's not what you say, it's how you say it. 
children are people too. They deserve respect. They deserve a conversation. And I just encourage everybody to try to be better and do better as the days go by. You will make mistakes. Things will happen. This conversation may not go the way you want it to go, but I just, I want to encourage putting in input so we can get output and build strong adults who aren't having suicidal thoughts and mental health concerns. And if we start early and do it early, then this this beautiful message that Toy is trying to bring for suicide prevention could hopefully the bar should lessen. Absolutely. And our CEO and visionary, Toy Burton, y'all. Oh, I just want to say thank you to both of you for um for making this exactly how I envisioned it. I I really just want to thank you for that. Um, like I said, as a preschool teacher. I've always felt it's important for us to start young. You know, we build strong children, we build strong adults, which in turn build strong communities. Yep. So thank you, you two. Thank you to everybody who joined us on our um, first launch. And we will be back again next Saturday at 11. Please join us. Please um, like the Facebook page so you'll be notified of when we go live. Follow Didi's Cry on Instagram and go to our website, ddscry.com, make a donation. Every little bit helps. And uh, we will see you next week. We next will see week. you next Saturday. See you guys. Thank you all so much. 11 o'clock. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.